I guess it's close enough to time to start. Hey, everybody. My name is not Richard, unfortunately. If you guys came here to see Richard Maynard, he couldn't make it, so I won't be offended if you leave. Um, <laughs> my name is Kevin Bringard, and today we're going to talk about um, infrastructure as cattle or herding the service cloud for fun and for profit. Um, it's sort of a, uh, you know, before ironic, and it's, it's sort of a custom implementation, if you will, of OpenStack on OpenStack or Triple O um, that we're doing at Cisco, where I work. And um, I think it's a lot of fun. Hopefully, you will as well. And we shall see how it goes. So everybody tells me that I should start off from a presentation with um, either a joke or a quote. So the joke is Neutron. And the qu <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I work a lot on Neutron. I love Neutron, but oh my goodness. Um, the quote, however, is this. What the hell is a service cloud? And that's attributed to everyone I've ever talked to about service cloud. Um, you may have also heard of it as under cloud or something like that. Um, basically, it's just clouds all the way down. Um, we're creating small footprint, sort of lowest common denominator, simple, basic virtualization orchestrator, um, sort of a hybrid cloud that's running all of your tenant services. So you've got some things that are bare metal, and we'll get into this a little bit just because they don't make sense to put onto, um, they don't make sense to put into VMs or it would just be a, a really bad idea. Um, and then coupled with a lot of services that are actually running on VMs and it allows you to really scale out horizontally um, in a pretty great way and we've leveraged it to a lot of success. So another way, it's a cloud to run your cloud and that's me, I said that. Um, so I want to start off by saying I think virtualizing infrastructure makes a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, as purveyors of cloud here, we all love OpenStack and, and we love to sell it and tell everybody how amazing it is and, you know, how you, like, you don't have to worry about your VMs if they die, whatever, it, you can scale out, it's awesome. So, you know, like, we tout the wonders of this API-driven chaos monkey, don't care if it dies sort of thing. And yet then, at least in a lot of places where I've been, we continue to deploy all of our stuff on bare metal and continue to try to scale out on metal. And I think that if we take that, you know, that, the concepts that we're selling our tenants and we, we apply them to ourselves, uh, it creates a nice, a nice symbiotic relationship there. So, um, and obviously the concept of OpenStack on OpenStack and bare metal as a service, that's not new. Um, you know, people are working towards that. There's obviously an entire project dedicated towards it. Um, and I think, at least in my experience, deploying to metal is time consuming. Even if you get it to the point where you can do it really quickly, it still takes time to like install the packages and you know, like bootstrap your, your hardware and do all of these things. It still takes you know, maybe a half an hour to get a piece of metal provisioned, even if you've got it like push button deploy ready. Um, whereas a VM, you spin it up, 30 seconds later, VM is up, you know exactly what the hardware is going to look like, you know what the profile is going to look like and you're totally good to go. Then you start applying your puppet and stuff like that, but I mean, at that point, that's, that's a different part of deploying to metal. So um, keeping that much extra capacity laying around isn't cheap, so if you've got tons and tons of physical hardware laying around, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna be able to just deploy quickly, you, know, you have to have hardware to deploy to, otherwise you, know, you have to go through, you have to purchase it, you have to get it installed, to get it wired up and racked and all those different things. And um, either that or you just keep it laying around. And it's not cheap to keep it laying around. So you either are over capacity or you're under capacity. You, you're spending a lot of money. It's just not really a great way of doing things. And again, I mean, this is exactly what we tell our tenants. We say, guys, you don't have to have capacity. Spin it up as you need it. Run heat, you know, apply a profile when you, when you get close to your capacity, whatever it may be, your thresholds. Um, so what we want to do is just, again, virtualize as much tenant infrastructure as we can. Um, but isn't that what Ironic is for? Kind of. I mean, Ironic is partly for doing bare metal as a service towards, um, like, if tenants actually need to deploy something on bare metal. And, and there's absolutely a place for that, and so I'm not necessarily belittling that there. But um, again, sort of more looking at, as people who are running clouds, how can we, how can we, how can we virtualize our control plane infrastructure? So. Um, to take a little bit of a side, a side note here on the, on the ironic thing, so the way that I've always explained OpenStack to people, so like I, my parents love to ask me questions about what I do, but my parents are very, very old, and they don't get it at all. So, <laughs> so I try to explain to them what I do, and, and they're like, wait, so like it has to do with computers, right? Um, so, but the way that I've often explained to tenants, right, is I, I say, you know, 
even people who are in technology who, who aren't necessarily old or who kind of do get it, um, often cloud confuses them a little bit, partly because there's tons of different clouds, you know, whether it's Dropbox cloud or Amazon cloud or, you know, Apple cloud or whatever. But um, also, it's it, you know they just they just it's it's hard to it's hard to get a tenant to think about well I've got my server and I've got my cage so how do I take that and put that into a cloud so um, I always try to describe it as like cage robots so you know if you think about a co-located data center you walk into the data center you've got your key which could be your credentials or your API key or whatever but you know your physical key in a data center it unlocks your cage there's cages everywhere but you only have access to the one that you have access to. And when you first get there, and when, uh, when you first set up a cage in a data center, it's empty. They give you basically a drop that gives you internet access, and beyond that, it's your cage. You do whatever you want with it. So you go in there, and you install some routers, and you configure the routers, and so you know, you're doing your Neutron here, your Neutron router create. You know, that's akin to racking a new router, and you do like a Nova boot. That's akin to racking a new server. Um, so if we think about cage robots and virtualizing our infrastructure in, these terminology, in this terminology, Instead of deploying new servers and racking new servers, again, we just do this exact same thing, but with our infrastructure. So OpenStack are like these little robots that you send into your cage to do your bidding. You say, I need a new server, I need a new router, I need a router configured this way, I need whatever you need. Robots go and do your stuff. So I think that Google and Elon Musk may not be happy about that, but I like robots. I think they're cool. So deploying straight to bare metal, it's, it's logically identical. It just uses a slightly different cage robot. So that's what Ironic is for. It's a different cage robot, and there's totally, you know, uh, there's totally a, a market for that and a place for that. But I don't really think in our infrastructure that's what it's for. So, and here are some other reasons. I'm personally, I'm opinionated. I like to do things the way that I like to do things. I already know how to do things the way I want to do them. And I don't particularly want to change how I do them. So, you know, I use Cobbler. I love Cobbler. It's awesome. So, you know, I want to keep using it. I use Puffet. You can you know, maybe you use Chef or Ansible or whatever you use. You know, some Perl scripts that you wrote when you were in university. Whatever it is, you've got your way of doing things, and you don't necessarily want to change. So, are we sure that it's actually going to um, that it's actually going to work? And you know, why should we change what works? Right? If it works for us, then why introduce a whole new workflow into what we're doing? So if we use our existing tooling, we know how to configure an API server. We know how to configure an Agio server. We know how to deploy new compute nodes, even like the physical thing. We've got our way of doing it. So we don't have to, don't have to integrate a thing, you know? Do we know if these are going to work? I don't know. So basically, service cloud is logically the same thing that you're doing today. You get to, going back to the cage robots, you get a new server. It's there. It's virtual. Everything's good to go. And then you just configure it using your existing tooling. You don't have to change anything. So what are the sorts of things that we put on VMs? So at Cisco, these are some of the things we put on VMs. Um, obviously, your opinion may differ, and that's totally cool. You can do it how you want. Um, we put API endpoints on VMs. So you know, Nova, Neutron, Glance, Heat, et cetera, all of the, all of the different services. Um, we put DNS servers. Into, into VMs, so we have like, you know, tenant facing, public facing, et cetera, DNS. Um, we put our MX servers, our SMTP servers, all that goes into, all that goes into VMs as well. Um, our message bus, so like Nagios goes in there, or sorry, Rabbit goes in there, and um, we do monitoring in there. I guess I didn't put it up there, but um, so things that don't, like obviously compute nodes. Um, if you want to try virtualization on virtualization, that's up to you. I personally don't want to do that. Um, so we have physical compute nodes. Uh, we put our network nodes and agents uh, directly on bare metal because I don't want to deal with trying to go through 500 tap devices to get to another 500 tap devices. Um, so that sounds pretty nasty to me. So maybe uh, we do put database servers into, uh, into VMs, um, logging servers. I don't know, depends on how much you need, what you need out of it, you know, your server profile, stuff like that, if you can get it out of a VM. Uh, your storage, I mean, if you want to try to run Ceph on VMs, that might be a fun project. I don't know if anybody's doing that or not. <laughs> Abe is saying no, so it's probably not a good idea, but you know, maybe, I don't know. That's sort of up to you, but this is kind of a, a little bit of a profile about what we put on VMs. So obviously, this is a hybrid cloud. You know, we've got something on physical servers, some things on virtual servers. Um, standard of what? Um, so could you think, imagine a world where all of your servers were the same, like, and so, Many, many moons ago, I worked at an ISP called Earthlink, and uh, my friend Abe over here did as well, and uh, my buddy John Dewey. And so Dewey and I had this idea that 
at, at Earthlink, we, had, we were running mostly Spark gear, and we had all of this various different Sun hardware everywhere. So we had like E4500s and V220s and V240s and V880s and all of this nonsense everywhere. And, and you would have, especially with the 4500s, you'd have you know, all these different, different trays and different ways that things would work out. And you'd, get like, you'd start getting random errors. And you'd get you know, like a core dump. And so you'd scat the core dump. And it turns out that there's one memory module in one tray in one server somewhere that is causing all kinds of problems for you. So you spend all this time troubleshooting it, and then you like, got to open a case with Sun, and then they send you a new RAM chip, and then you, you, know, you do all this stuff, and it was just nasty. Um, so what Dewey and I wanted to do was, and this was in 2003, 2004, um, we wanted to take and just have a bank of just generic servers. We didn't really care what they were, and virtualize services on them. And obviously, this was you know, pre-OpenStack or anything like that. And KVM was still pretty young, if it was even if it was even around at all. <laughs> so I'm trying to remember what we were going to use. But either way, we wanted to virtualize the services. Because I mean, at an ISP, all we have were you know, MX and uh, SNTP and you know, Apache servers. And Earthlink, you know, we were running like personal start page, which was like a Java thing. And all sorts of, like, but it was, all just, it was all just web services. So we totally wanted to virtualize all of this stuff so that everything looked the same. And the idea being that you could walk in there. You didn't have to troubleshoot which RAM module was bad, which you know, CPU was bad. You would just walk in there, say, this server is giving me trouble. You would rip that server out. You'd throw a new one in. You'd deal with replacing the server later and get an RM8 or whatever you were going to do with it. And then you're done. Services come back up. Problem solved. So I like that idea. So I don't have to deal with, you know, I got, well, I've got some Dell gear over here and some HP gear over here and some, obviously, some UCS gear everywhere. And um, so, you know, I've got all this different stuff all over the place. And I don't want to deal with that. So I like the idea of commoditizing as much as I can. And if I can commoditize my service cloud as well, and not only, not only run my tenant services in a scalable architecture in a way that I don't care if I just have to rip out a server and throw it back in, um, but it's the identical hardware that I'm running my tenant stuff on, because it's all just compute nodes. So every rack looks the same. Um, and you've already developed a growth strategy for what you want your compute racks to look like. You know, you know, when, you know what your failure domains are. You've created, your, you've created your availability zones. You've, um, you know, all, these, all of those different things. You've, uh, you've worked out, you know, your affinity, like how, I'm, how I place VMs in different places. You know, you've already done all this stuff for your tenants. So if you just apply that exact same logic, you've already done all the work, just apply it to your service cloud as well. When do I need to add new compute nodes? When do I need to do this? When do I need to do that? Um, you know exactly when you need to do it. It also allows you to more easily individualize services. So one server, one service. Um, as it stands today, like I've, I've deployed some pretty big clouds in the past, and we would, we would, you know, you would basically you would get like two control racks is how we used to do it at a previous employer, and you know we would have to we would have to figure out profiles of different of different applications, and it'd be like, well, this one can take this many Nova APIs and this many Glance APIs, and you know, like I'll spread the databases out over these guys and do this different thing, and it's this crazy like Tetris game to try to fit everything in there as, as tight as you possibly can. Um, now, with the service cloud, you don't particularly care, because aside from a few services which need to run on metal, you're just spinning up VMs. And the VMs sort of will categorize themselves and will Tetris themselves, if you will, into the, uh, into the hypervisors that you have. So um, you spin up a Nova API server and say, there's a Nova API server. Spin up a Glance API server, and, th and that's all that runs on it. It's just that one thing. Um, Another thing that we started doing, and this, is, this was Abe's idea, is, is, is testing individual component upgrades. So we have, um, for instance, Glance, right? Like we're running Icehouse, we run around Juno. We test, we test Glance, Juno's Glance in our, in, our, in our lab in a VM, and then we bring it up actually next to our existing Icehouse running stuff. And then you're actually running two different versions, but you don't have to worry about like, you know, library mismatches and all these other things because that Glance API, you know, instance is, is its own machine. It's basically its own VM. So we're sort of creating, you know, like Python virtual environments, but out of whole machines. And so you can bring up certain things and if you find out that like, you know, for instance, Kilo Icehouse has some fix that you really, or sorry, <laughs> Kilo Icehouse, oy vey. <laughs> that was, you don't want that. Uh, <laughs> 
Kilo Horizon has some fix that you really, really want or really, really need, um, and you want to run it. So you just like deploy it in its own VM, bring it up. In theory, it's API compatible. And so you just start using it, and now you get some new feature, or some new whatever, and it all just sort of works, and you're not worrying about stomping on yourself. Um, so you can move quickly in your lab, and it looks just like production. Um, so when you're doing your stuff, you know, you know, that the, you know that the machine that you're doing, that you're working on in, in DevStack or in, in Vagrant or whatever you're using is literally identical to the machine that you're going to be using in production because it's the same image. Um, and so the service cloud itself doesn't need a lot of resources. And that's sort of what I was talking about at the beginning when I said like lowest common denominator. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's not taking any tenant traffic. So you don't need a ton of API servers. In theory, it doesn't even need to be HA. You just, you know, really, as long as you can, as long as you can get what you need done, um, then, you know, that's fine. So you probably don't need like all the network as a service stuff. Maybe you do. That's up to you. Um, we run, we run it with Neutron and OVS so that we can plug it into, kind of. That's that's a whole other thing with a whole other architecture talk, but it has to do with service VMs and stuff like that. Um, but, I mean, you could do that with Nova Network, and by and large, I would advocate for actually using Nova Network for a service cloud, because you just need something simple, stable, fast that works. Um, it's really as close to a production dev stack cloud as you're going to get. So, you know, if you <laughs> all of those warnings in dev stack that say, don't run this in production, well, I mean, this is kind of like a, like a production dev stack cloud, right? Um, it's just very simple, very basic. All you got to do is be able to spin up a few VMs, and there's only one tenant, so it's not, you don't even have to worry about multi-tenancy. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like. <coughs> Excuse me, it'll look very, very familiar. Um, logically, it's probably pretty identical to the clouds that you're already building. So I mean, you have this load balancer pair over here. Maybe that's a physical load balancer. Maybe that's just HA. Um, these are your service API endpoints. So in this particular diagram, I showed them as HA, but they don't necessarily have to be. Uh, you know, Glance, and obviously this is a very simple example. You'd have other APIs and things like that in there. Uh, it goes, talks to your message bus, and then your service compute. Very, very simple. Um, it's small scale. It's a known quantity. Easy peasy. We've been doing this since there, right? Um, so, okay. So how is it useful? Well, here's why it's useful. So this is what your tenants see, right? So this load balancer pair, maybe this is the same load balancer pair. If you have like physical load balancers, you're terminating SSL for your tenant cloud, your service cloud. However, you want to, you know, shard that up. That's up to you. But you've got your, you know, like your tenant Nova APIs here and your tenant Glance APIs, and then the same deal um, with the message bus. But then all of a sudden, you're like, oh my gosh, API is running really slow. You know, there's a herd coming through. I just can't handle it. Can't handle the load. So you run a couple of API calls, and boom, now you have four Nova API servers, scaled out very quickly, very easily. Um, obviously, you could add more than just two. You could add, you know, 100 more. Just that easy. As long as you have the, co the, 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 compute, the compute capacity, that's a tongue twister, for it, um, you can do it. Same thing with the Glance APIs. You need more. All of a sudden, there's just more. Um, they come up. They plug into the network, add them to the load balancer pair, and now you've got scalability on your API layer. Um, same thing with the message bus. You know, you lose a piece of hardware. One of your rabbit nodes is gone. Your cluster is going crazy. Spin up a new rabbit node, add it to the cluster, problem solved. Um, so it's very, very simple, and it, you know, it works out pretty well, at least in our, at least in our experience. Um, you get HA mostly for free. Again, going back to what I was saying before, you've already figured out your failure domains. You've already figured out you know, your availability zones, your affinity, all that different stuff. So if you're just using those same strategies, then VMs are just getting placed automatically in places where if you lose an entire availability zone, your tenant-facing services are still up. Because, again, reusing work, reusable code. Um, so you can just treat it like any other web application. Because at its core, really, I mean, on the back end, OpenStack does a lot of crazy things. But on the front end, from what the tenant sees and, and, the, and the data plane, for the most part, is really just a, a standard three-tier web app. You've got your load balancer, talks to an application server, talks to a database server, and then it does some stuff. Um, so by, I mean, it's obviously a little more complicated than that. But you know, it's sort of the same thing. Um, it's super agile. I mean, you can spin up servers in minutes in, instead of like we were talking about before, where it can even take, even if you have the hardware there and you've got it push button ready, it can take 30, 40 minutes to image a new piece of metal. Um, if you, you know, you just all of a sudden randomly, you're like, you know what, we've got these two things running on DNS, but we just, or these two DNS running on, running on the same servers, we really want to split it out. Run a couple API commands, you've got two new servers, run your puppet manifest on them, problem solved. 
Um, you want to migrate to a new version of Nagios, but want to test your configs. You test them in, you know, you test them in your dev environment. Again, you know the dev environment is identical to what you're going to be doing in production. You bring up the new productions, the new production ones with the good, with the new configs. Nova, delete the old ones. Problem solved. Just <laughs> need another host to do stuff on. Like I, that happens to me all the time. I'm like, man, I really wish I had a machine I could just like log into and just do some stuff on. <laughs> I don't even know what. Just stuff, right? <laughs> like make it look like I'm working. Spin up a terminal and log in. <laughs> make it spin up a terminal, log into something. So such agility, much amaze. Wow. It's <laughs> Doge is very, very happy with this. So speaking of dogs, dog fooding. That's the other thing that's really, really great here. So universal troubleshooting. Your tenant facing cloud is the same thing as what your as what as what your as what your your control plane cloud is. So you don't have to worry about, you know, you get your operators who are like, they can log into they can log into the tenant ones and they're already familiar with the uh, with the with the service cloud as well because it's the exact same thing. Um, have a hardware failure? Don't worry about it. Shoot it in the head. Spin up new ones. You know, whatever's, whatever was on that machine, you don't care. Get rid of it. Spin them up. Image new ones. And again, this is super key for me. The operators are now users of the system that they're supporting. And like, at least in large shops, in my experience, when you get like, you know, kind of first tier operations guys, they're super awesome at troubleshooting and debugging. Um, you know, like low-level Linux stuff and you know, or whatever, you know, it's like you got some weird network problem, they can like, you know, they can figure it out. But then they don't necessarily know OpenStack because why would they? You know, they're system administrators. So if you make them users of the system that they're supporting, you know, if they have to get a new server, if they have to issue Nova Boot, they have to configure router, Nova routers, they have to, you know, do whatever, then they're going to be more familiar with it and they're going to be able to support your customers better. Because when somebody calls in and says, oh, you know, I'm trying this, trying to attach this volume and they can go, oh, that flag is wrong. I know that flag is wrong because, you know, I made that same mistake or whatever. Um, so that's a huge one for me as well. So at this point, you're probably like, hey, let's virtualize all the things. And I mean, that's, that's how I was, but not necessarily. You might, maybe, but there are certainly places where this might not work for you. So for instance, if you run a small scale shop, this probably isn't worth it. You know, if you've got two racks, I doubt you want to set up a whole cloud to run two, rack, two racks worth of cloud. Um, if you just disagree that virtualized infrastructure makes sense, then you probably don't want to do this. And that's totally cool. Like, I don't have all the answers. We're all just, you know, beggars looking for bread, right? <laughs> um, so if you, do, if you absolutely need a high degree of vertical scale, then this probably isn't for you either. So you know, if, if for some strange reason your application profile is, you know what, I really just need 1,000 Nova API processes to run on one machine, then certainly this isn't for you. Because here we're talking about horizontal scale, not vertical scale. Um, you know, there's lots of other things too. I mean, if you're setting up private clouds, like just individual drop a pod somewhere, you know, same sort of thing. That's, I would consider that kind of small scale. This may or may not be for you, depending on how big that scale is. But however, if you're looking for a way, to, uh, a way to scale your control infrastructure quickly, um, this might be for you. A way to commoditize your hardware, you know that story I told about Earthlink? Like, that this is what we were looking for when Dewey and I were trying to get that set up in, at Earthlink. Like, it was literally this. It would have been amazing. Just rip out the hardware, who cares? Throw a new piece in. Like, treat hardware like VMs in a sense. Um, if you think that dog fooding is good for your platform, if you think it's good for your product, then, you know, this could probably be for you. So, join the herd. I see a question in the front. How do you mean? Sure, sure. So the question is, is it a chicken and egg problem? And I mean, to a degree, yes. Though, and the answer to that is that Again, we're already all deploying OpenStack Cloud. So we, in theory, we know how to deploy OpenStack. We know how to deploy it on Metal, and we're opinionated on how we do that. So if we take, if we take the things that we're doing already um, and we just make it on a really small scale that you have to do one time, um, then that's how you do the first one. And so, but absolutely, there always has to be a starting point. So the first one is you have to do a quote unquote manual install on Metal. Um, and you know you have to have the infrastructure and whatever in place to do that. So the assumption is, of course, that you're already doing that because you know, if we're deploying OpenStack, you're deploying it. So do you deploy to Metal? 
or you know, do you deploy to Metal at Infinium, or do you deploy to Metal once and then start virtualizing things? Sure. I do, and I mean, so that would be where you'd have to, where you would need to figure out on your own what your failure domains are and where you would put, what you would put on VMs and what you wouldn't. So in that case, again, I would say, you know, like you're gonna have your Nova scheduler is gonna be HA on multiple physical hypervisors in your service cloud, and so that way if you lose one or two or even the whole availability zone, and that's where, that's that HA for free, that's sort of what I was talking about. Because you've already figured out your strategy for HA, for where you're gonna put your hardware and to make sure that your cloud isn't gonna fall over. So you apply those tenants to your service cloud and you set that up that one time, and then in theory it takes care of itself. But I mean, again, it's not a bulletproof solution. Of course, there's always going to be a problem that we can find, and I mean, we've run into plenty of problems as well, and I tried to cover them here, but so, did that answer your question? Maybe, yes, no, not satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I, thank you. I mean, I'm happy to talk about it more um, if you'd like later. So are there any other questions? Anybody want to know anything else? I see a hand up there. Yes, sir. So do you mean, sorry, so the question was questions about versioning. Um, Version of OpenStack, release of OpenStack. So do you mean the release you're running in the service cloud versus the release you're running on top of it? Yeah. Um, no, I don't really have much of an opinion on that personally other than to say the beauty of the service cloud being so simple is that you really could be running probably like a Diablo cloud. Yeah, it could be background. Well, absolutely, and there's, and there's, in theory, there's no interdependency there other than, other than the further you, the further you get, so like if you're still running Diablo in your service cloud, and you know you're running, you know, Juno or even Kilo up here. Then the dog fooding aspect is going to be a little bit less because the people who are operating this, the operation of Diablo is very different than the operation of you know, Juno or Kilo. So there's that aspect of it. And of course, upgrades is a whole other problem. And I mean, upgrading a service cloud and stuff like that. Frankly, we haven't gotten there yet, <laughs> and we'll figure it out when we cross, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But um, I, I don't. I mean, in theory, they're they're completely separate things. That's we don't really care if a tenant, what a tenant runs in their stuff, so same thing. Yes, sir? It is physically separate hardware, but we keep it in the same failure domain. So I mean, it's its its, its own thing and it's its own failure domain, but we apply it logically the same failure domains to it. So the way we've done it is is—is that it's its own. It's its own separate hardware. Um, we've had some people ask about running it on the same. If you wanted to cut down on cost, you certainly could do that. So instead of having three or four or five or whatever racks of compute for service cloud, you could certainly multi-home it on your tenant compute stuff. We opted not to do that because we get a pretty good deal on CS gear, but. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, we're, that's a good question. Um, Jeff, do you know how many racks we're running? It's pretty big. <laughs> We've got something like five or six different, different, different geographic locations. Um, you know, 30 or 40 racks per. Um, I, I would have to do the math on how many cores that is and stuff like that. Six or seven different geographic locations, yeah. And we're deploying more, like literally, we're, de we're deploying more as we speak. So yeah, this week, next week, there are more getting deployed as well. Um, and we found since implementing, I mean, since implementing this, we've started, our, our rev has gotten faster because we've been able to just like put a small cloud in there and then spin up a bunch of stuff and then the dev stuff translates a lot more. There's been a lot less like, uh, you know, it's the whole thing is like software lifecycle driven because we test everything in our dev environment and then we can be, we can rest assured that it's identical to what's gonna go into, at least on top of in the VMs and stuff like that. It's helped us rev a lot faster as we scale out our, as we scale out our data centers. That's a good question. Um, I want to say, was it 32, 42, something like that? I can't remember if they're one U or two U machines that we're running, but it's, I mean, it's not small. I would, I could, I could find the information on it if you'd like. Sorry, he was asking how big the, how big our deployments are. I don't remember how many machines per rack we have. It's 32 C-series, I think. Okay. So we have 32 C-series, UCS C-series. Um, per rack, and then, like I say, however many racks per, you know, 
10, 15, 20, 30 racks per deploy. It sort of depends. Some deploys are bigger than others. So, and then all of that, like I say, all of that runs on. And then as far as service cloud goes, we've got three compute racks um, and then two control racks is, where we, is what we run our service cloud on. And so those three compute racks, you know, we've got however many cores of CPU that we can, that we can allocate um, API servers and you know, database servers and rabbit servers and all that stuff too. And that's, so that's our service cloud deploy. And then this other, and then the tenant cloud is, is, what, is what's much bigger. Yes, we do. Correct. We, well, that's why I say we talked about doing that, and um, the main reason that we didn't was because we just figured, again, because we get a good deal on UCS gear, we didn't, we didn't figure that, it, we, we just wanted to keep it completely separate. But if you're on a budget, you can absolutely do that, and I wouldn't see a problem with that. Yeah, more like the dog booting. Well, yeah, and that's exactly it. The other downside of that would be sort of back to this other question over here would be that it makes it, if you're mixing compute racks, it makes it more difficult to have a service cloud that's running a, like a known version and then be able to upgrade on top of it because if, you, if it's all mixed together, then whatever this, the service cloud is running needs to, is intertwined with what the tenant cloud is running. Um, so it, it creates more of an interdependency. Right, which again is why we decided to make them completely separate. <laughs> To help to help alleviate that. Any other questions? I don't know how much time we have. Am I out of time? Maybe I don't know. Anybody? Anybody? Well, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I know it's valuable. Thank you all for coming. Hopefully, it was useful. And I'm Kay Bringard on IRC. Um, so feel free to find me. I'm in I'm in OpenStack channels all the time. So feel free to to hit me up if you have any questions. Thanks, you guys.